Hello, welcome to Sigma Tech Learning Hall. I'll be your instructor for biology. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. Now, if you don't already have this installed in your device, I would like you to download the app in order to follow along in this class. Now, exam guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams. Exams such as the UTME, the post-UTME, WIAC, GCE, IGMB, KCPE, JUPEB, Calbepedia. In the junior sections, we also have the BECE, we have the JSCE, and so much more. Now, you can download the app from www.examguide.com or you visit the Google Play Store to download. Now, please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to update yourselves on new videos that will be coming up. Now, if you're ready for this class, let's get started. Today, we're going to be looking at a, an exciting topic, cell reaction to its environment, as well as excretion. Now, when we're talking about cell reaction to its environment, we're actually looking at irritability. Irritability, or you can call it sensitivity or response. The ability of living organisms to respond to their external environment. So, cell reaction to its environment is simply talking about irritability. Now, if you could still remember, we said that cells are regarded as the basic unit of life because cells can carry out all life processes or activities. And these life processes are what we summarized as the characteristics of living things. It means that cells can move, cells can respire, cells can feed or obtain nutrients, cells can respond or react to their external environmental changes in the internal environment. Cells can grow, cells can excrete, cells can reproduce, cells can compete for space, for survival, cells can adapt to a particular environment, and then cells die. So it means that cells can carry out all these life processes. And today we're going to be looking at how the cells carry out um, 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 irritability or sensitivity or able to react to, their, to changes in the environment. And we're also going to see how cells get rid of metabolic waste products. Now, at the end of this particular class, you're expected to know one or two things or you're expected to be able to attend to some questions. Now, the first thing you should be able to do at the end of this class is to be able to define what irritability is and also tell us the purpose for irritability or response. Number two, you should be able to mention and define the types of responses, or in some books they'll tell you it's movement, types of responses. And number three, you should be able to compare the different types of responses in living organisms, different types of responses. Number four, you should be able to define excretion, able to define excretion and uh, state the purpose for excretion. And then number five, you should be able to identify and mention excretory organs of some organisms, right? Now let's start up with the first one, which has to do with cell reaction to its environment. We're going to be looking at the definition of, of response or irritability. We're also going to be looking at the purpose for irritability. Now, all, note that all living things are able to detect and respond to certain changes in the environment. Now, these changes in our environment can be a change in temperature, it can be a change in light, it can be a change in water or relative humidity, and so many changes. If there is an increase in temperature, you, 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 you have several adaptive features or sorry, body structures that helps you um, respond to it. And um, if there is an increase in, in, in light intensity, you have the ability to also respond to it. Now, when we're talking about response or mostly sensitivity, that is why we have the sense organs. With the sense organs helps us respond to several things, respond to several changes 
in our environment. We have the eyes, it helps us respond to light. We have our skin, it helps us respond to temperature changes and so many others. We have our ears that helps us respond to sound, changes in sound. We have our tongue that helps us respond to changes in taste and so many other things, all right? So we're gonna be looking at the definition of irritability. Now, irritability is simply the ability of living organisms to respond to changes in their environment. Like I said, these changes can simply be termed stimulus. These changes can simply be termed stimulus. So the ability of living organisms to respond to stimulus or ability of living organisms to respond to changes in the environment is what we call irritability or sensitivity. Now, like I said, it has to do with it is has to do with all living things, both plants and animals. Now, in animals, it takes the whole of the body of the organism to respond to changes. The whole of the organism respond to changes. But in terms of plants, there are several parts that respond to changes. We have the leaves. The leaves respond to changes in the environment. We have the roots. The roots respond to changes. We have the, the flowers. The flowers respond to changes. And then we have the tendrils. The tendrils also respond to changes. I repeat, there are several organs that respond to changes in plants. We have the leaves. We have the roots. We have the flowers. And then we have the tendrils. All right? Now, let's take a look at types of responses or movement as in, res as, 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 as in relation with um, response to uh, changes in the environment. How um, living organisms respond to these changes and move about based on these changes. Now, there are basically three types of responses or movement. Now, number one, we call it tactic movement or response. Number two is nastic movement or response. And number three is tropic movement or response. Not tactic movement or response, nastic movement or response, and then tropic movement or response. And we're gonna be looking at each of them and see how it operates. Now let's start with the first one which is called the tactic movement. Now, what is tactic movement? Now, before I go into the definition of tactic movement or response, I want you to understand another name for tactic response. We can also call it um, taxism. 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 Another name for tactic response is taxism. Okay? Now, what is tactic response or taxism. Now, tactic response or taxism is a directional movement or response in which a whole organism moves from one place to another in response to an external stimulus. I repeat, it is a directional response in which the whole of an organism moves from one place to another in response to an external stimulus. In response to an external stimulus. It simply means that, for I can give an instance of myself, if the temperature is or probably, um, if the light intensity is high, some organisms might tend to move away from that light intensity. That is the whole of the organism moving from one place or locomoting from one place to another based on the external stimulus. Based on the external stimulus. Now, I want you to understand, since we say that taxism is directional response, it means that it can be either positive or negative. So we have positive response and we have negative response. Now, when do we say a response is negative? Is when um, the organism is moving away from an external stimulus. 
listen, when an organism is moving away from an external stimulus, we refer to that as a negative response. But when an organism is moving towards an external stimulus, we refer to that as a positive response, as a positive response. And when it is a tactic response, it involves the movement of the whole organism, the movement of the whole organism. Now, we have several examples of tactic movement or tactic response. We have what we call thermotaxis. Now, thermo, as the name implies, refers to temperature or it involves temperature. So, thermotaxis is a response to heat or change in temperature or temperature stimulus. Number two example is phototaxis. That is response to changes in light intensity or light stimulus. Number three is chemotaxis. Chemo talks about chemicals. So it is in response to chemical stimulus. Or you can say it is a tactic movement or tactic movement in response to chemical stimulus. Then we also have the hydrotaxis, which involves water. So it is in response to water or humidity or water stimulus. Okay? So these are four examples of tactic movement. Now take a look at this uh, diagram on the screen. You can see that uh, there are some, uh, like we have the moth, I think that's a moth, a moth moving towards light, moving towards light. So you see that the whole of the organism is moving towards light. And there is a, that light, so since it is light, that example is a phototaxis, or you can call it phototaxism. Okay, the reason why it is called a taxism is because the whole of the organism is moving towards that light. And what type of response would you call this? Is it a negative response or a positive response? As you can see that the moth, the arm or the insect there, or moth, is moving towards the light. And when we say, and I told you when something, when an organism, the whole of an organism is moving towards a stimulus, an external stimulus, it means it is a positive word, response. So this is an example of a positive response. Number two type of movement is the nastic movement. Nastic movement. Now, another name for nastic movement is nastism. 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 But please take note. Nastism or nastic movement is a non-directional movement in which part of a plant moves in response to a stimulus. Please note the difference. Note the difference between tactic movement and nastic movement. In tactic movement, it is a directional movement or response in which the whole of an organism moves from one place to another in response to a stimulus. But in terms of nastic movement, it is a non-directional movement in which part, part, not the whole of an organism, but it also if, uh, relates to mostly plants, in which part of a plant, please take note of this, in which part of a plant moves in response to stimulus, moves in response to stimulus. Now we have several examples of um, nastic movement, we have closing of the morning glory flower in response to low intensity or light intensity. You can agree with me, the morning glory flower, when the sun starts um, setting, the morning glory flower closes. But when the sun starts rising, it opens, it blossoms, opens. Then the next example is the opening of the petals of a sunflower when it is day and closing when it is night, just as I've explained. Then the other example is that the closing of the leaflet of a flamboyant flower and the folding of the leaflet of a mimosa plant when touched. I believe some of you have seen the mimosa plant when touched, it folds inside. It is non-directional. It has no direction. It is facing. It just closes. Okay? Now, it means that since it is non-directional, it means that it does not have 
um, it is neither positive nor negative response. Now take a look at this diagram here or this uh, um, structure there or picture. You can see that a, a hand is touching a part of the leaf, touching the leaf or a part of the plant which is the leaf. And once the hand gets in contact with the leaf, the leaf shrinks or, okay, or closes. So this is an example of a nasty response, an example of a nasty response. Now the next number three is what we call tropic response. Tropic response. Now tropic response, please note another name for tropic response or movement is called tropism. Another name for tropic response or movement is called tropism. Now, tropism is a directional response. I wish you were getting the differences between tactic, nastic, and tropic. In nastic, in tactic, it is directional. In nastic, it is non-directional. In tropic, it is directional. So, tropic movement or yes, movement is a directional movement in which part of a plant moves in response to stimulus, to a stimulus, part of a plant. Also, in tactic movement, we said it is the whole organism that is moving. In nastic movement, we said it is part of a, 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 an organism that is moving. And then in tropic movement, we said it is part of a, an organism that is also moving. Now, let's take a look at some examples of tropic response. We have phototropism. Phototropism. Now, phototropism is the movement or response of part of a plant to a light stimulus. To a light stimulus. Now, an instance is plants bending towards light. Now, if you keep a particular plant and a light source, or let's say you put the plant inside a dark cupboard and you open a slit or a hole on the cupboard and allow light rays to pass through it, okay? You will later discover that part of the plant will be bending towards where the light rays or the source of light is. So that is an example of phototropism. We have another example which is called geotropism. Now, under geotropism, it is a response or movement in response to gravity, to gravity stimulus, to gravity. Now, for instance, the shoot of a plant, they bend towards what? Gravity. And then we also have the hydrotropism. Hydro talks about water, so it has to do with the response to water or humidity. And then we have the thigmotropism. Thigmotropism is the response of part of a plant to touch, part of a plant to touch. So that is, these are some of the examples of tropic response. Now we have an example on the screen. Now, like I just told you, if you put a particular plant in a dark cupboard, you can see the cupboard all around, the, 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 the black shade around it, and then a light source is there, you will see that the plant will be moving towards the light source. But if it is, the light source is probably on the corner, on the side, and uh, there is a hole opening, and the light penetrates, you will find out that the, the plant will begin to bend towards that light. So the part of the plant that is bending towards that light is an example of phototropism. An example of phototropism. Now, let's compare what we have discussed among the three types of responses. We said taxism, we talked about taxism, we talked about nastism, and then we discussed um, um, tropism. Now, in terms of um, nastism, if we're looking at found in, where do we see or where does nastis, uh, taxism or these types, these three types of um, responses, where can it be found? Where does it occur or take place? In taxism, taxism occurs both in plants and animals. It occurs in animals and some plants. Nastism occurs in plants. Tropism actually occurs in plants and also animals. 
Then response. Please take note in terms of response. In taxism, it is directional. The response is directional. In narcissism, the, di the, the, the response is non-directional. And then in tropism, the response is directional. Nature of movement. In taxism, it is the whole organism that moves. In narcissism, it is part of the organism that moves. And then in tropism, it is also part of the organism that moves. Now, there are several responses that can be termed growth movement. Growth movement. In terms of taxism, taxism is never a growth movement because it has to do with the whole of the organism moving from one place to another. But in terms of nastism and tropism, yes, these are also ways plants grow. So it is a growth movement. Okay? Now let's take a look at um, roles of auxins in growth movement. Now what are auxins? Auxins are actually um, hormones. They are called growth stimulating hormones. They are growth, hormones that are responsible for growth in plants. Now, auxins are the best known plant hormones and they control tropism in plants. Okay? Now, auxins can be a, a cells that are found at the shoot tip of plants. They are found at the shoot tips of plants. Now, how does the auxin carry out phototropism in plants or control tropism or influences tropism in plant. Now we have the following stages. Number one, auxins are produced at the tip of the shoots. Number two, they migrate or diffuse to the area of growth, which is at the root tips and the shoots and all that. And then number three, the shoot will grow straight as long as there is equal concentration of auxins in all the sides. And number four, on equal illumination of the shoot causes auxins to migrate to the side of the shoot away from light. Next is that the increase in auxin concentration causes increase in growth or makes it faster on that particular side. And then the last is that this eventually causes a curvature or bending. Please take note, a curvature or bending towards the source of light resulting in a positive phototropism, resulting in a positive phototropism. Please take note, when the auxin acts, there is also the bending of light, sorry, the bending of the part of the plant towards light is an example of phototropism and it is controlled by auxins, all right? Controlled by auxins. As you can see on the, on the screen there, you see that that particular purported plant is bending towards it. Then if you look beneath, you can see the auxin molecules. You see they are concentrated in a particular side. And because of the concentration and the light they are responding to, which is phototropism, there is a curvature or there is a bending of that part of that plant towards light. And that brings about cell elongation. It brings about cell elongation and growth. Okay, so that is phototropism being influenced by the hormone called auxins. Okay, now moving to excretion, cellular excretion. We're looking at cellular excretion. Now, what is excretion? Excretion can simply be defined as the process by which living organisms get rid of metabolic waste products. Remember, we talked about um, metabolism, and we said it is the sum total of all the activities. Now, every time these activities occur in the cells, there are byproducts, there are waste products. And the removal of these waste products, the process by which these waste products are being removed from the body, is what we refer to as excretion. We refer to them as excretion. Now, the major purpose for removing this waste product is that those waste products, they are toxic, poisonous to the body. They are toxic or poisonous to the body. Now, we have several forms in which waste products are excreted out of the body. Several forms. Number one, we have the solid form. 
solid form. An example of the solid form is we have uric acid, we have tannins, we have alkaloids and mucilages. Most of these um, solid forms are found in um, plants, okay, flowering plants. And then we also have the liquid form of excretory waste. We have water, we have sweat, we have urine, we have urea, we have dissolved nitrogenous waste, we have um, dissolved mineral salts, latex, gum, etc. All these are liquid forms of um, excretory waste products. And then the last one is gaseous form. I repeat, we have the solid form, we have the liquid form, and then we have the gaseous form. The gaseous form includes examples like the carbon dioxide, we have ammonia, and so on. These are uh, metabolic waste that needs to be removed from the body. Like we said, if they are allowed inside the cells of the body, they become toxic to um, the body or to the cells. Now, take a look at some of the excretory organs. Some of the excretory organs of some organisms. Excretory organs of some organisms. Now, we have the protozoa. We have the protozoa. The protozoa excretes using the organ it calls contractile vacuoles. The contractile vacuoles. The excretory waste in protozoa include carbon dioxide, water, and mineral salt. You can see on the screen there, we have the contractile vacuoles. When waste enter into the contractile vacuoles, the protozoa, mostly amoeba, from time to time, empties this um, content in the contractile vacuole, thereby um, removing or getting rid of those um, excretory or metabolic waste. Next is the flatworms. The flatworms. Another name for flatworms, they are called platyhelminths. An example of a flatworm is tapeworm. Now, the excretory organ of flatworms are called flame cells. Flame cells. You can see it on the diagram there. Flame cells. So, the flame cell is the excretory organ of the flatworm. Their excretory waste include water, urea, carbon dioxide, and nitrogenous waste. Okay? Number three on the line is roundworm. Roundworm. Now, another name for roundworm is nematoda. And it includes things like the Ascaris lumbricoid. Now, the excretory organ of roundworms, of roundworm is called nephridia. Nephridia. You can see on the diagram there, you can see the roundworm, okay? You can see nephridia indicated there. Nephridia. You can see it here. So the nephridia is the excretory organ of roundworm. Now, their excretory waste products include carbon dioxide, urea, and nitrogenous waste. Number four on the list is insects. In this case, we're taking a look at the cockroach. Cockroach as an example of the insect. Now, the um, excretory organ of the, the cockroach is the Malpighian tubules. The Malpighian tubules is the excretory organ of the insect of the cockroach, of cockroach, which is an insect. Now, their excretory waste products include carbon dioxide, water, and uric acid. You can see the Malpighian tubules there in the diagram. Beneath the mesotron or the midgut, we have the Malpighian tubules. And then number five is vertebrates. In this case, we're looking at man because we have several excretory organs in different types of vertebrates. Remember the vertebrates, we have things like the Pisces, we have the apes, we have um, the amphibians, we have the reptiles, and then we have the mammals. But in this case, we are looking at mammals, and the example of mammal we are taking a look at is human beings or man. The excretory organ of man is, or include, we have the lungs, we have the skin, we have the liver, and then we have the kidney. Now, the lungs, they excrete carbon dioxide. The skin excretes sweat. The liver excretes what we call bile, all right? 
bile, which helps in the emulsifications of fats. And then the kidney excretes urine or urine. Okay, now that is the structure of the urinary system. We have this kidney here, which you can see it is being shaped and is connected to the bladder through the ureter. And then the urine is passed out from the body through the urethra. You can see the structure of the kidney. They are being shaped, they are impaired. Now, what are the excretory waste products? We have water, we have carbon dioxide, we have mineral salts, and then we have nitrogenous waste. And then finally is flowering plants. Flowering plants. Now, flowering plants also have their own excretory organ. The excretory organs of flowering plants include the stomata and the lenticel. The stomata is located in the leaf of the plant, and then the lenticel is located at the stem or the shoot of the plant. Now, we are going to be looking at a comparison among all the three types of responses we have just looked at. We're going to be discussing or comparing taxism, nastism, and as well as tropism. Now, if you look at this, uh, we're going to be talking about some um, parameters. We're going to use some parameters to actually compare them, as we have seen while we were discussing each of these responses. First is in terms of um, response. Let's, talk, let's use the parameters response. Now, in taxism, response is directional. Response is directional. We told you it can be positive, it can be a negative response. But in terms of nastism, response is non-directional. Non-directional. Then also in tropism, response is directional. Okay? Response is directional. Another parameter we can use to compare, I'm just going to use about three parameters. Another parameter we can use to compare these three types of um, responses is nature of movement. Nature of movement. In terms of taxism, the nature of movement is the whole organism. The whole organism actually moves. But in nastism, it is part of the organism that moves. And then in tropism, it is part of the organism that also moves. And then the final parameter we can use to compare these three types of responses is if their response or movement is a growth movement. Now, taxism is not a growth movement. Please take note of that. Taxism is not a growth movement. Nastism is a growth movement. And then tropism is also a growth movement. Now, let's talk about the roles of auxins in growth movement. The roles of auxins in growth movement. Mostly tropism, mostly phototropism is a growth movement. We've talk, remember, we just finished discussing that um, tropism is a growth movement. Now, what influences or what brings about growth movement in terms of tropism is a hormone called auxin. Auxin is one of the best plant hormone for growth. Best plant hormone for growth. Now, how does it happen? Now, first of all, the auxins are produced at the tip of the shoots. Now, when they are produced at the tip of the shoots, they diffuse or move to the areas of growth. Now, once they get there, the shoot will start grow, will, will grow straight as long as there is equal concentration of auxins along that area. Now, once that is done, unequal illumination of the shoots causes auxins to migrate to other sides of the shoot away from the what? Light. So they move away from the light. Now, this increases, this increase in um, auxin concentration causes increase in growth or makes it faster on that side. Okay, so this eventually causes a curve, or a curvature, or bending towards the source of light, resulting to positive phototropism. Resulting to positive phototropism. As you can see in the screen, we have phototropism. The plants are bending towards light. And if you look downwards, auxin molecules are concentrated. On a particular place, you can see those dotted molecules there. They, are, they, they, they represent the auxin molecules. And based on that, 
you can see a curvature or a bending towards the source of light. A bending towards the source of light. You can see it at as the third uh, distance, it bends. Now, those bending uh, uh, of the plant results in growth. And if the sun is positioned uh, in, in front of it or at the top of it, it grows upwards, elongates upwards. If it is at the side, it bends towards it. Okay. Now, those type of responses bring about growth movement. Now, having understood that on irritability, let's move to excretion. Excretion. Very quickly, what is excretion? Excretion simply is the removal of metabolic waste products from the body of a living organism. Removal of metabolic waste products from the body of a living organism. Now, what is the major purpose for excretion. The major purpose for excretion is to remove metabolic waste and these metabolic waste, they are very poisonous or toxic to the body. To remove metabolic waste which are toxic to the body. Now we have different forms in which excretory waste are being removed from the body or different forms in which metabolic waste are being excreted out from the body of a living organism. The first one is the solid form. Examples of solid form, we have the uric acid, tannins, and so on, mostly found in plants. And then we have the liquid form, which includes water, sweat, urine, urea, and so on, mostly found in animals. And then we have the gaseous form, which is both found in plants and animals, which includes carbon dioxide, uh, ammonia, and so many other gases that are removed as metabolic waste. Now, let's look at excretory organs of some organisms. Excretory organs of some organisms. Now, we're going to start with the first one, which is called the protozoa. Now, the excretory organ of the protozoa is body surface and contractile vacuoles. The body surfaces and the contractile vacuoles. If you look on the screen, you're going to see the label of the contractile vacuoles. You see that. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in the structure A, B, okay, it is well labeled, that is an amoeba. Amoeba possesses contractile vacuoles, which it uses to carry out osmoregulation regulation and excretion of waste. Now, what are the excretory waste products um, excreted in protozoa? We have carbon dioxide, we have water, and then we have mineral salts. Number two is the flatworms. Another name for flatworms is platyhelminths. Platyhelminths. Now, flatworms remove have excretory organs called flame cell, flame cell, and the waste they excrete or remove from their bodies include we have water, we have um, urea, we have carbon dioxide, and we have nitrogenous waste. Number three on the row is roundworms. Round worms. Another name for round worms is nematoda. Nematoda. Now the excretory organ of round worms or nematoda is nephridia. Nephridia. And the excretory waste, the uh, waste products they remove from the body include carbon dioxide, urea, and nitrogenous waste. Carbon dioxide, urea, and nitrogenous waste. Number four is the insect is insects and the insect we're looking at here is cockroach the excretory organ of a cockroach is the malpighian tubules and the waste products they excrete include carbon dioxide water and uric acid and then number four is vertebrates but in this case the particular vertebrate we're looking at is man okay we're looking at man the excretory organs in man include the lungs, it includes the skin, it includes liver, and then the kidney. The lungs actually excretes carbon dioxide, the skin excretes sweat, the liver excretes bile, and the kidney excretes urine. Now, these are some of the excretory waste that is being removed from the body of vertebrates, mostly man. And then finally is flowering plants. Flowering plants, 
their excretory organs is the stomata and the lenticel. The stomata is found in the leaves of flowering plants and then the lenticel is found in the stem or the shoots of flowering plants. And the waste products they excrete include carbon dioxide, alkaloids, gum, mucilages, latex, resins and so many others. These are some of the excretory waste they excrete out. Now, we have come to an end in this particular class, but let's take a look at some evaluation questions. Okay? Now, question one. Which of the following is not an excretory product? Not an excretory product. Now, we have A, urea, B, carbon dioxide, and then C, feces. Please, and then D, salt. Remember, if you check all through the excretory waste Oh, sorry, all through the waste pro products that have been excreted by living organisms, you will discover we made mention of urea, we made mention of carbon dioxide, we made mention of mineral salts or salts, but there is no mention of feces. Please note, feces is not an excretory waste. It is an undigested food product. So in other words, feces... We don't remove feces or feces, the removal of feces is not called excretion. Let me put it this way. The removal of feces is not called excretion. It is called ejection. Ejection. Ejection is simply the removal of undigested food substances. So feces is an undigested food substance. Is that okay? So the correct option is C. Number two, in insects, nitrogenous waste are excreted through the, remember we talked about made use of uh, um, the cockroach as an example, and the correct answer is malfigian tubules, which is option B. It can be option A. Flame cell is the excretory organ of flatworms. It can be also option C. Nephridia is the excretory organ of roundworms, and then option D is the excretory organ of vertebrates. So B is the correct answer and the excretory organ of an insect. And then number four, the movement of a wood louse towards an area of high humidity, of high humidity. Remember I told you I have two types of responses. It can be negative, it can also be positive. So moving towards is a positive response. Now a wood louse moves the whole of its body. And when you're moving the whole of your body, that is taxism and not nastism. And of course, nastism, we said there is no, it is, it, it is a non-directional response. So the correct answer there is D, option D. So it is positive taxism. And then finally, number four, uh, the fourth question, a change in the normal state of an environment can be referred to as stimulus. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using your exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can also learn particular topics of interest with different modes like study mode, uh, mock mode, and even practice mode. It, is also, it also has other features that makes learning very fun. Now, it is a must for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, hit the notifica notification bell, and share the videos to your loved ones and friends that will benefit from it. Bye for now.